Hey, Marco. Welcome to the His and Her Money Show. Hello, Marco. Hey, guys. How's it going? Happy to be here. It's going well, and we're super glad to have you here. We're glad that you're here because this is a topic that a lot of people have a lot of questions about, and so we'd love to bring experts on like yourself to help us navigate and make the appropriate decisions when it comes to wealth building and investment strategies. And you know quite a bit about investing in real estate, so we're super glad to be able to have you here today. But before we start digging into your advice for us, can you just say hello to everyone that is tuned in and let them know what you are all about? Well, hello to everyone who's tuned in. <laughs> I'm look. I, I'm I'm I consider myself a pretty simple guy. At the end of the day, I like to think of myself as an investor, an entrepreneur, a business person, and also a coach and teacher. And I don't charge for my coaching. I just want to give that information to people for free, just like what you guys are doing, which I think is fantastic. So keep up the great work. But at the end of the day, you know, you guys know as well as I do that we don't get financial education in our school system. And, you know, it's, it's pretty rare that someone walks out of the school system knowing how to start a business, how to invest in real estate or the stock market or whatever it may be. So that was part of the passion that drove me to get involved in real estate investing and other asset classes early on in my life. In fact, you know, you asked me a little bit about myself. I actually started investing in real estate when I turned 18 years old. And the reason I, I started young is because that's how long I had to wait to qualify for financing. And so... I just knew the writing was on the wall at that time because I knew that was the way to create wealth. So um, who am I? I'm a guy who loves to invest. I love to um, help, help other people do the same thing, create wealth and create passive income and, and just show them and teach them how to do that as freely as possible. So talk about that because you just, I don't want to just like That's gloss right, right <laughs> on that. You're 18 years old and you make, a huge decision to become a real estate investor. At 18, a lot of us were nervous about living on a college dorm for the first time away from our parents. <laughs> right. And you're like, yeah, let me spend six, seven figures uh, uh, of money on, on a real estate property. So talk, how did that even become a thought for you at that age? Why were you not scared? And, and talk about just that experience, that first property you got at 18 years old. That's a very good question. And I've been actually thinking about this more and more lately. And I think part of it has to do with when my parents got divorced when I was 16. I saw my mother struggle working two jobs to try and make ends meet to pay the bills and put food on the table for my brother and I. And so, you know, single mother working two jobs, we barely saw her. And, you know, of course, we were in school at the same time. I didn't want to go through that. So that I think that was to a large degree a motivating factor. I didn't want to have to struggle like she did for a number of years. And so um, looking around, I just recognized that people who created wealth and who were financially well off, I wouldn't say rich, but they were certainly wealthy, owned real estate. And so they either created their wealth in real estate or they created their wealth elsewhere, but they held it in real estate. That was always the go-to. So being young, but being observant and attentive, I recognized that that was really where we had to go. Um, and we was me, but, um, but my future direction. And so, you know, I just made the decision, let's, let's jump in and do it. And, you know, honestly, I didn't take a course. Um, and I don't say that to brag. I just, I just jumped in head first and I thought, I know I can do this. I said, I can do this and I will do this. And I, I tried and I did. And for the most part, it was very, very successful. I bought a distressed property, fixed it up with the help of my uncle, who was a carpenter. Um, I put a sign on the lawn. There was no internet back then. So you couldn't advertise online. I took paper applications. I interviewed people. I say interview in air quotes uh, because I didn't know what I was doing, but I just, it went by gut, not so much by, you know, mind, um, but lease this property. But I did make one big mistake and I'll tell you what the big mistake is because I want your audience to learn from this lesson. The biggest mistake I made on that first rental property is I sold it a few years later. I walked away with a big chunk of equity because I, I, I was in the right market at the right time and it, the equity in the property grew, but I was stupid in the fact that I took that equity and I went elsewhere and did whatever I did with that equity instead of leveraging it or reinvesting it into more properties to build up my passive income, to build up what I was building. Uh, young and naive, I guess, you know, is dumb, but in hindsight, you look back and you recognize, oh yeah, that was a dumb mistake. I could have been further ahead today if I didn't do that. But that's, that's where I got started and, and probably why. 
Now, a lot of people are in a place where they're trying to be wise with their money. They're looking at all the different various investment choices that are out there that people talk about. Why is real estate investing such a solid uh, consideration that people should think about when it comes to investing their money? Well, there are a lot of reasons, and that's probably an entire episode of, of your show. <laughs> but the reality is, is that real estate has always been historically uh, the, the go-to asset class that is a true wealth preserver and a true wealth creator. First and foremost, and in no particular order, you have to understand real estate is a hard asset, not a paper asset. When you own real estate, you own the dirt, you own the sticks and the bricks that are on the land. It is a hard asset. And because it's a hard asset, it is by default an inflation hedge. It will keep up over time. It's supposed to keep up with inflation. So the replacement cost of any real estate is going to be determined by the cost of the, the copper, the concrete, the sticks, the bricks, the lumber, all that stuff and the dirt that it's under. So if that's true, then you know that it will keep up with inflation. It just has to because the, the materials to replace it always inflate because of inflation. And real estate gives you income. It, it's one of those vehicles that provides passive income, cash flow every month. Some people call it a check in the mail. So isn't that a beautiful thing? The other thing too is you have the ability to take depreciation from this asset. The IRS literally says you could depreciate this asset over 27 and a half years and take that phantom deduction and deduct it against all your other passive income. And for some people, they're in all their income, active and passive income, which is incredible. And the beautiful thing is you don't have to spend a penny to get that depreciation. It is there, it is on the table, and it is available to you without having to spend anything. You have equity growth over time, because guess what? If you have tenants living in that property and they're paying you monthly, uh, monthly rent, part of that rent's going to amortize that loan. It's paying down that loan. So each and every month, you have a little chunk of equity more and more and more as time goes on. In addition to that, people think about equity as appreciation, but that is, that is another benefit. Guess what? Over time, because of inflationary effects and supply and demand, property values go up, so you have more equity. And last but not least is one of the most powerful things about real estate that you can't get with any other asset class, and that is leverage. The fact that I can put 20% down and leverage that down payment five to one by borrowing other people's money, i.e. the bank or a lender, allows me to take the, the savings that I have and leverage that into real estate and control 100% of the asset, get 100% of the benefits, but only put 20% of the, of the cost or the investment into that investment, borrow the other 80%, and guess what? I can keep doing that over and over and over again. And you can't do that with any other asset class. Stocks maybe come close with a, a margin account, but that's only 50%, and that's on limited a set of stocks. And there's a margin call risk there. Like if the, the value of that stock goes down, guess what? They're going to call you up and say, hey, you got to put some money in because you're below that 50% threshold. Yeah. So I, I know some people have tried their hand at real estate. Some people have probably heard horror stories and successful stories, We got stories, horror right? stories of our own. Yeah. And so I know that fear plays a part in it. But you teach something that's so profound, the 10 rules of successful real estate investing. Let's talk about that a little bit. What's the first one? Sure. So let, let's just hit these one at a time and then you can ask me any questions or interrupt me if you have any comments. But, you know, the first the first rule is 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 the it is the rule on purpose. What I mean by that is the first rule is to educate yourself. And if you're going to invest, you need to invest in yourself first. You need to build your knowledge because knowledge is the new currency. So if you don't build your knowledge, and I don't mean to become a PhD or an expert, but you do need to understand fundamentally a lot about a little things just so you can have an intelligent conversation with a real estate agent or a contractor or your CPA or an asset protection attorney, whatever it is. But you don't know what you don't know, and it's important to under have an understanding. Because if you don't have that level of understanding, you're really following other people's advice, and you don't know if it's good or bad advice. So knowledge will take you from being a good investor to becoming a great investor. It, it will take you out of the realm of being average and will also take you out of the realm of not doing anything, being stagnant. So it's important to educate yourself, invest in yourself, build your knowledge. And there's a lot of things that you can do to do that. Like your podcast, for example, is a great asset. There are lots of online resources. There are books that are inexpensive. There are even real estate magazines today. There's three of them that I know of. 
So uh, podcasts, uh, um, audio books, you name it. So invest in yourself. That's, that's the first rule is educate yourself. Now, uh, you said magazines. That one kind of struck me because I didn't know there were real estate magazines out there. I read some books. You have an awesome podcast, and we'll link to your podcast in the show notes of this episode. What are these magazines? Uh, well, the biggest one and the one that's been around the longest is uh, called Think Realty. It's kind of a deceiving name because you think it's about, you know, for realtors and real estate, but it actually it's specifically for real estate investors about real estate investing. So Think Realty Magazine is, is actually the one I um, advertise in every month. Uh, there are a couple others. Um, there's a new one that just launched and I don't remember the name. And then there's another one called REI Inc. And that one only uh, launched about three months ago. So. Awesome. And, oh, and there's Realty 411. I forgot. There's another one that's been around for a long time. All right. We'll be sure to have those links yeah. in the show notes as well. That's pretty good. So now we are moving in the realm of educating ourselves, reading books, listening to podcasts, reading magazines. What should we be doing next? What's the next rule? So the next thing you should be doing is setting investment goals. And I know you hear this time and time again, people say, you know, set goals, set goals. The reality is, is a very, very tiny percentage of the population actually sets goals. Everybody wishes to be rich, right? Or to be financially free. But the thing is, is a goal is much different than, be, than a wish. You could wish to be rich, but that doesn't mean you'll ever take the steps or have a plan to get there. So when you set clear and specific investment goals, what you're effectively doing is putting the forces of the universe into play. And then you're creating a roadmap, which becomes your action plan to become financially independent. So you, ha you have to understand that it's been proven statistically time and time again that if you, those people who actually write down their investment goals are far more likely to achieve them, even if they don't hit the goal, they come close. But the people who don't write in goals, they actually fail far, far more often. I say fail as in they don't achieve what they want, which is ultimately a wish, not a goal. But it's been proven time and time again, you're statistically far more likely to achieve your financial independence when you write goals down. They've, they've actually followed people over the course of decades. Uh, to prove this time and time again. So the bottom line is this, your goals should include whatever it may be, you know, a financial income goal, the number of properties you have to acquire every year, a certain level of, of cash flow from each property, the types of properties, locations, whatever you want, but just make it clear, specific, measurable, and attainable, and write it down and read it on a regular basis, daily if you can. Yeah, goals are good, yeah. They're very important. So number three, so this is a mistake people made long ago, back in 2004, 2005, 2006, uh, my rules never speculate. Don't speculate. Always invest with a long-term perspective in mind. You see, uh, speculating is just focused on short-term gains in appreciation. And that's dangerous, especially in a heated market, because you don't know when the market's going to top off. Uh, as investors, you really should be investing for cash flow, which is, you know, a segue to my next, uh, my next rule. But you never know when a market's going to peak. And it usually takes six to nine months after the fact when you actually can verify the fact that a market has cooled off or topped. So it's dangerous to chase after appreciation. Really what you should be doing is only investing in prudent value investments, value plays where the numbers make sense the day you buy it. If that investment doesn't cash flow in month number one, it's not by my definition an investment. An investment generates cash flow. It creates income. Now, number four is invest for cash flow. So when we come across a property, yeah. you know, what numbers should we be looking at trying to run or calculate to figure out, like you just said, this should make sense. The numbers should make sense from day one. How do we go about investing for cash flow intelligently? Yeah, that's a good question. So, for, for, so to set the stage, you should always be investing for cash flow because I, I like to refer to cash flow as the glue that holds your deal together. You see, as you hold real estate investments, the equity will grow over time. Your net worth will increase. You'll become wealthier because that equity grows. And the more properties you have, the more that happens. Uh, it happens faster and faster because it's, it's across multiples of, of those properties. But you need to understand that for an investment to make sense, and by my definition, to be an investment, it has to cash flow from day one. Now, how much it should cash flow is, is different for everybody. Everybody has different expectations. So generally speaking, and these are very broad stroke rules of thumb, on a per door basis, when you acquire a rental property, that property, if you leverage it with financing, um, it should be, it should generate a net, 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 a true net cash flow of two to $400 per month per door. Um, you, sometimes you'll see it 
you know, on the upper end of that range. Sometimes you'll see it lower if you're in like a premium A class neighborhood um, and you're in a, an area that is experiencing hyper growth. Often you won't see high cash flows, but you still want that positive cash flow. But the, the point is invest for cash flow. Ideally, you want to see a rent to price or rent to value ratio of 1%. That means if you buy a $100,000 property, ideally you want it to rent for about 1000 a month. 1100 would be awesome. 900 is still okay. 800 is about my threshold. But around 1% of that purchase price or that value is what you want to target because you know that typically the numbers will work out. And you'll get the cash flows you need. But again, cash flow is king. You've got to invest for cash flow. So now in that, when you say uh, you want to look for two to four hundred dollars per door, what and you and you called it net, net, net. So I'm assuming you're saying after certain expenses are paid, there should be left over two to four hundred dollars for it to be a quality uh, potential property to invest in. Yeah, yeah. True. A truly net number means that you've budgeted, not only deducted your expenses, but you've budgeted for future expenses. And the two big ones are, are vacancy, vacancy allowance, because you know your property is going to have a turnover at some point in time. The tenant will move out, a new tenant will move in. So you got to budget for that one to two months. It could be less. Often we see it being less, but one, um, at least a month. So vacancy allowance is one thing you budget for, and that could be 4%, 6%, maybe as high as 8% of the gross rental income, depending on the type of neighborhood you're in. The other thing you want to budget for are your repairs and maintenance. And again, four, six, eight percent. You want to budget something. You may not be spending that this month, next month, or the month after, but at some point in time you will. So if you've got that in your operating account because you've budgeted for it for the last 12, 24 months, guess what? You know when 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 everything when the dust settles, your net cash flow will average out to be 200, 300 bucks a month, maybe more, depending on where you are. That's good advice. And then when people are putting money I'm assuming in a separate account, um, you know, set aside for repairs and things like that. Is it per address or are they able to have one particular account if they have five uh, real estate properties? Like, how do you do that? Do you separate them individually or do they just really all just be dumped into one account? Oh, that's a beautiful question. So, <laughs> so here's, here's my general advice. When you're starting out, if it's your first property or your second property, I suggest budgeting out about three months of gross income to have in reserve. So if you have a hundred thousand dollar property, it's running for a thousand dollars a month, have about $3,000 in your operating account that you don't touch. It's just operating capital. It's in reserve. Um, then as you add properties to your portfolio and you grow your portfolio, you scale that back because you, you're not going to have a turnover, a vacancy or a repair on every property at the same time. You just have to have that budgeted in, for whatever your real estate company or empire is. And so oh, as you increase your, um, your portfolio, you scale that back. But as a rule of thumb in the beginning, you want to have two, three, maybe four, but around three months of gross rent in reserve for those first few properties. And then you slowly scale that back. So you'll always have reserves. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's good. Yeah, great advice. Now your next step, we're at number five is interesting. You say that we should be market agnostic. Talk to us about that concept. Yeah, so you should be you should be agnostic if you really want to be true to yourself and the market, because the thing is, is you guys are in Chicago, beautiful city, uh, but what happens in Chicago is different than what happens down here in Southern California, and, and it's different than what happens in let's say Detroit, Michigan, and it's different than what happens in Tampa, Florida. The fact is, is we live in a big country. This big country has well over 400 metropolitan statistical areas. And each one of these markets are local markets. They have their own dynamics, their own supply and demand dynamics. They have their own business environment. They have their own um, industries and reasons for people to move in and move out. And because of that, what happens in one market is different than another market. So of course you want to invest for cash flow. Let's not forget the previous rules. But at the same time, you want to be in a market that's geographically, uh, not geographically, uh, diverse in sense of industry. Uh, you you want to invest in a market that makes sense, that has strong fundamentals, a healthy housing market. It's got jobs and job growth. Um, you got to look at all these factors and say, yeah, that market makes a lot of sense to invest in because I feel that my money is safe in that investment and it is going to grow and pay me income and grow my wealth over time. So, the reason I bring this up as being market agnostic is a lot of the so-called gurus, quote unquote, and tell you and mistakenly to invest within a one or two uh, hour radius of where you live. 
that's flawed advice, especially if you are a passive real estate investor, someone who's just actively building a portfolio and you're not a fixer and flipper. Because if you're a fix and flipper, it's good to be within driving distance of your properties. But if you're, if you're just buying to hold and create income and wealth over time, it doesn't matter where they're located. It could be anywhere in the country. Uh, it's just like Coke. Coke is headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia. And if I think Coke is the best deal going in terms of a stock, do I have to live in, in Atlanta, Georgia? I could live in Southern California, invest in Coca-Cola. doesn't matter where I live. I'm being agnostic. Same thing with real estate. It shouldn't matter. You should put your money where it's going to work the hardest for you. And that could be Chicago. And I live in Southern California. And, and if I wasn't agnostic, I wouldn't be investing in Chicago or wherever it may be. Policy Genius guarantees the best life insurance price for you and those you love. It's so simple to protect your family today in five easy steps. One, calculate quotes. Two, compare companies. Three, apply online. Four, receive expert advice. And five, rest easy. It really is that simple. Calculate, compare, apply with Policy Genius. For more info, head on over to hisandhermoney.com forward slash Policy Genius. So I'm assuming when you are investing out of where you live in a different state, then you probably have to have a team, somebody that probably does have a set of eyes on your property at any given time. Critically important. Yeah, your team is, is critically important, which is actually a segue to, um, you know, the next rule and one later on. But yes, to your point, the team concept is very important because uh, even though you're a long distance investor, you still have to have professional full service property management. That's that's critical. That's one of your key team players. Um, you know, a, a company like ours that does, you know, turnkey real estate investments provides those for investors is another key player because we not only bring the expertise for choosing the markets and the properties, but we also have these vetted people that you're going to take advantage of. We essentially hand them over to you as referrals and you take that. And those are all people on your team. So you need different people on your team. You know, your source, you need the, uh, the property management, this asset protection attorney, your CPA, um, uh, your property inspector. And then of course, you know, the, there's the title company and other odds and ends like that. But yeah, these are all people on your team. So yes, you do need those people. All right. So now next step number six is a rule number six, I should say, is take a top down approach. What do you mean by that? So I made the mistake long ago when I was investing in the Northeast from down here in the Southwest, uh, buying properties, uh, many cases sight unseen, and that was okay. But I learned early on and quickly that you shouldn't be married to the property. I can present you a property that's going to look great on paper and I can show you wonderful photos and you're going to fall in love with the deal. But if I told you it was in a, on a dilapidated street with three burnouts in a neighborhood that is crime ridden and very sketchy. Uh, you're going to have high turnover and it's in a depressed market where people are leaving that market. Um, and there are no jobs. Would you still invest in it? Probably not. Not at right? all. Yeah. <laughs> right. So the, the mistake I made and the mistake a lot of investors make is they, there's, there's, they look at the deal first and they probably don't look beyond that deal. They might, it might be in an overall market, like a big metropolitan area that says, oh, okay, I, I'm okay with Chicago. But we all know that whether we're talking about De Chicago or Detroit or anywhere else like that, you always have areas that are, 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 are bad areas, uh, areas you don't want to invest in. So, so taking a top-down approach means this, essentially, you start with a market, a market that has strong fundamentals, has job growth and, and low unemployment and a diverse industry and people are moving to that market because there are drivers drawing them in, like you know, new businesses, move businesses moving in, all that kind of stuff. When you've identified the market and everything checks out, you checked all the boxes on the market, now you start looking at submarkets and neighborhoods to identify where in that market, that metropolitan area you wanna be. And when you have identified those and you have the team working with you to be able to do that, then, uh, then you start looking at the deals, the properties themselves. And that's what I mean by taking a top-down approach, because like I said, a lot of people start with a property and then they may or may not, but they may step back and look at the neighborhood and step back and look at the market and, and, and decide whether it's an investment. But a lot of people actually don't end up doing that. You know, Start with the market, work your way down, because you have to take a big picture approach. You want the jobs and the migration and all the good stuff going on in the market, because that's the sustainability of investing in real estate. Number seven, diversify across markets. Talk about that one. 
Yeah. So, you know, you hear these financial advisors always talk about diversification, you know, buy so many of this type of stock, so many, so much of that type of stock and maybe get into some ETFs and some mutual funds and this and that. They're talking about diversification, you know, and they're really diversifying within the same asset class. These are all paper assets. When it comes to real estate, the way you diversify is to um, it, build a portfolio that spans three to five markets. And usually that's in different states. And that's geographic diversification because like what we just talked about, every market is independent of each other. What happens in one market is not the same as the other. If you have a portfolio in uh, a part of your portfolio in one market, let's say Chicago, and then you build up the re uh, more of it in, let's say, Indianapolis or Memphis, and then you build up some more of your real estate portfolio investments in, let's say, Jacksonville, Florida, you're geographically diversified. That minimizes your quote unquote risk. So you know, if, if something should happen in one market where there's an increased, you know, unemployment and you've got some, you know, fluctuations in that market, property values are cycling because real estate does cycle just like anything else. Um, overall, your, your, your portfolio will withstand, you know, the fluctuations in the economy and in the local real estate markets. So it's just a smart thing to diversify. And plus you could take advantage of different factors in different markets. You could be in, invested in some markets that are cash flow markets where they're strong in cash flow. And you can invest in other markets that are strong with growth potential. They have stronger appreciation potential. And so you're kind of balancing out the different types of investments in real estate to build out that portfolio. And last but not least, a comment I'll make about diversifying across markets is I have this rule of thumb of investing in three to five properties in three to five markets. If you do that, you'll have a very good uh, financial foundation and real estate portfolio because at the end of the day, you really don't need to be in more than five markets. But if you have three to five properties or more in three markets, four markets, that's good enough. That's, that, that will build your financial independence and that will diversify you across markets. Let's talk about the psychology of this for a while, because people may be thinking, you know, they might have nerves about just that first property in their own city. And you're really challenging us to say, don't just be agnostic to one market. Don't just look in one city. Think about other cities. And that that could cause like some some fear to bubble up in people. Right. Like, how did how did you how do you coach and teach others to be willing to look outside of the comfortable area that they live in and know by heart, like the back of their hand? Yeah, that's a very good question. And, and, and you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's, it's fear. You said it yourself. A lot of people never stop to think, uh, not everybody, of course, but a lot of people don't stop to think about the possibilities of what they could do investing out of their local market, that it actually may be better in another market, that the grass is actually greener in another market because they don't stop to study it and ask questions. You know, what's going on in my market? Why should I invest here? What's going on in that market? Why should I invest there? Am I better off in that market and why? Here, here's, a good, here's a quick example that's related. It's not exactly what we're talking about, but it'll paint the picture. We have some clients, for example, that come out of coastal California. They're equity rich and cash flow poor. They have a lot of equity in properties, maybe even just one property, but they've got hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity in, in a rental. They can take that 100, 200,000 or more, some cases a lot more, equity out uh, and do a 1031 exchange, a tax deferred exchange, and move that equity into one or more other markets and increase the size of their portfolio two times, three times, sometimes four times uh, or more. And in doing so, they're one, increasing their cash flow dramatically, many times over. Uh, number two, they're getting out of a, a bubble market which has higher downside risk than these other markets that they're being, uh, that they're moving their equity to, you know, with other properties. And number three, they're diversifying themselves. They're, they're geographically diversified because they're probably buying properties in different locations, uh, depending on how much equity they're pulling out. So, so th that's, that's the whole thing about diversification. Um, now, when you think about that logically and prudently, you could take the emotion out of it. Now fear, you can start to take the fear out of it. And that's really the only thing holding people back is the fact that they're not, they've never done it before or they're not sure how to do it. But guess what? If you, if you think it through, you learn about it, you ask questions, you talk to someone, and you talk to uh, you know, one of our investment counselors, we educate you on that process, and you have the whole team of people to help you do that. Everybody I mentioned before, plus your 1031 accommodator, the person who's going to handle the exchange, guess what? You can do that, and you can save yourself, not only save yourself a lot of 
potential headache and downside risk, you can increase your cash flow and put yourself in a far better situation. And I use that only as an example to illustrate the thing of, of how fear can hold you back. It's going to hurt you. So you're better off working with the right people, learn about the things you don't know about and how you can better yourself. Wow. So you talked about the importance of having the right team and rule number eight of yours is to use a professional property management uh, team. Talk about that and how important that is. Yeah, well, we all know that real uh, property management is a thankless job. I'm not sure. I've, I've yet to meet someone who likes to do it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's one of those things where um, you're dealing with tenants and some people may like that, but most people I don't think want to be dealing with with you know tenants and ten look most tenants are good and if you're in good neighborhoods you usually have good or great tenants so you know you hear a lot about the toilets at two in the morning you know all these kind of horror stories the reality is, is i'm i don't i i've never heard that ever happen to anybody i i've never met somebody who's ever had prob a problem like that issues come up sure we're people it's you know humans move humans lose their job you know they have the, they transition whatever the case is but at the end of the day you should focus on finding deals and building real estate portfolio, increasing your income so you have more savings to redeploy into more real estate, not managing your own properties. Unless the property's in your market, you happen to be one of those lucky people that live in a great market, you're close to your rentals, you know how to manage property and you want to do it, fine, then do it, maybe on a limited basis. But for most of us, we want to have solid property management, full service property management in each of the markets where we have our our portfolio, because let's face it, our time is very, very valuable. It's better off if we spend our time focused with our, with our career, spending time with our family, going to Johnny's soccer game on the weekend, uh, looking for more property, you know, just enjoying life. Uh, real estate is there to help build a lifestyle and create financial independence and ultimately financial freedom. Focus on doing that, not so much the management. This is why I say always use professional property management. How do you find a professional property management team that's qualified or that is actually good? Because some people, you know, they cousin do it on the side. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. So like you, you specifically say a professional property professional. management. Well, that, yeah, you're right. There's, there's a lot of um, mom and pops and there's a lot of uh, solo um, for property managers. Actually, that was one of the mistakes I made without even knowing I was making a mistake way back when, uh, back in 2004. I had a real estate agent as my property manager and she was a full-time real estate agent and a part-time property manager. So her, her focus wasn't spent, you know, managing the properties she was managing. It was, it was a side gig. So it didn't, it always took second priority to everything else she was doing, which was selling real estate to buyers and listing properties. So full service property management is a company that handles everything from soup to nuts. You know, the, you'll never hear from them unless there's a major problem and that's rare. So, um, so they'll just basically, you know, screen qualified tenants, place your tenants, collect the rents, make sure, answer questions. If there are any uh, deal with any issues that come up, fix any repairs that need to be fixed. And you only, and you don't hear from them unless it's, you know, a larger repair bill. Uh, otherwise, they're just depositing your income into your bank account each and every month and you just don't hear from them. They'll send you reports. You can log in and check the status of your properties. I mean, that's always there. But, uh, you know, it's important to have professional property management. But back to your question, how do you find them? Reputation is critically important. You can do a lot of research online. Uh, there's a lot of websites and tools today that allow you to ferret this out. Uh, but a lot of times property management comes from referrals, recommendations. You might already be working with some companies or you might know other investors who are in that market and they'll refer people to you. They'll say, yeah, work with these companies. They're great. These companies I've had problems with, maybe avoid them. And so th that's really how it starts more often than not. Uh, just to kind of throw in real quick, you know, working with a company like ours, we've already vetted a long list of of property management companies and lenders and asset protection attorneys and CPAs and this and then that. And those are just resources available to you as an investor, you know, at no cost because that just comes as part of the counseling that we provide. So, awesome. Awesome. Nice. so number nine, ninth rule, maintain control. Talk yes, about sir. that. Yes, sir. So maintaining control is really just about being a direct investor. See, when you invest in most things, you're typically investing in paper assets or you're investing in a fund or a fund manager or a corporation. And it's really a, a bunch of faceless people that you may not know. Now, if you're investing in a syndication 
and you know the people or you, you, you know of their reputation and you feel comfortable and you've vetted them out, that's okay. You're technically investing in a paper asset, but at the end of the day, you are a part owner in the hard asset of real estate. So really, when I say maintain control, it means, it means build your real estate portfolio, control your real estate portfolio, you determine who you work with, who you hire to manage that real estate portfolio. You call the shots. Essentially, you're the CEO of your own real estate business, your own real estate empire. And you set the direction and you control and you hire and fire. And that way, you know what's going on. And if something's going right, it's partly because of you. If something's going wrong, it's partly because of you. You don't have that say in control and the, and the voting ability, et cetera, et cetera, when you're investing in partnerships or, or funds. But you do when you invest in real estate. Rule number 10, leverage your investment capital. This is huge. This is powerful. Leveraging your investment capital is, we touched upon this before. If you have $20,000, $25,000, you can essentially purchase a $100,000 plus rental property in a good market, in a good neighborhood, generate monthly income, create wealth and grow your equity over time, have the tax benefits and rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. The beautiful thing about real estate, like I said before, lenders are tripping over themselves to lend you money. Assuming you qualify, every lender is competing for your business. They want to give you the money. They want to give you 80, up to 80% of the purchase price because they know real estate is a sound, solid, tried and true, historically proven asset class. So the fact that you can invest in real estate with only 20% down, leverage your overall return, magnify your wealth creation, and build true wealth over time and legacy wealth where you could pass it on to your children, their children's children and affect multiple generations. That all comes because real estate's a powerful investment and it's magnified by the fact that you can actually borrow OPM, other people's money. So if you have, if you buy right in the right markets, you have the right team, you have positive cash flow, and you uh, just have the right team members, like I said before on your team, you will be very successful and you'd be crazy not to borrow the cheap money we have available today at these low rates and the five-ish percent range on 30-year fixed rate mortgages. If I ask you the question, how much of that cheap debt money would you want, what would your answer be? Probably be as much as I could possibly get, right? I mean, we're, at, we're still at historically low interest rates. And the fact that you could borrow that cheap and lock it in for 30 years, and, and invest in properties that are generating double digit rates of return. You're nuts not to be doing that. You're crazy, you know? So wow. this was great, yeah. great, great info. So tell everybody a little bit more about your company, your podcast and how they can stay in touch with you. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate you asking. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we have two websites, passive real estate is the same. It's also the name of the podcast, passive real estate investing. I, I specifically titled that because I want to, paint the picture that people can create wealth and financial freedom going through a simple journey that we've laid out in our company from taking you from wherever you are to where you want to be financially free. And so, um, you know, that journey is, is our methodology and it's tried and true because I've been doing it for a long time and I just turned it into a business. And so that's what we do. And our company is Norada Real Estate Investments. The website is Norada Real Estate.com, N-O-R-A-D-A, Norada Real Estate. Um, but yeah, we just love to teach people how to invest in real estate and do it for free. And we have all the tools and resources. We're in 22 markets with turnkey rental properties that are ready for purchase on any given day. And, um, I just wanted to make it simple and, and as easy as possible for people to be able to invest passively in real estate and build their portfolio while they're working a full-time job, running, a, you know, their family affairs, enjoying life and doing whatever they want to do. So. Wow. We'll be sure to have links to all of those uh, resources in the show notes of this episode. Marco, this has been fantastic information yes. that you have shared with us. Thank you so much for taking Thank time you. out of your schedule to come on the show today. Honestly, it's been my pleasure. Thank you guys. Appreciate it. Keep up the good work.